Hello, the purpose of this video is to go through and talk about the structure of DNA. Now, our story begins with two scientists. There's a scientist named Francis Crick, who's actually a British physicist, and then James Watson, an American biologist. And their whole purpose was to try to figure out the structure of DNA. So they were working together to study this. They're actually working on this problem in Britain while they were studying. And th there are some things to start off that they knew about when they were trying to build the structure of DNA. So they knew the shape of the nucleotides and they knew that there were four nucleotides altogether. The other thing they knew was that uh, the nucleotides in DNA come in pairs. So they got this piece of information about the pairs of nucleotides from a scientist who came before them. His name was Erwin Chargoff. And what Chargoff had discovered is that when it comes to analyzing genetic material, there was always the same amount of adenine and thymine, and then guanine and cytosine in all living things. So if he took a DNA sample from like crickets and analyzed it, the amounts of adenine and thymine would be the same. And then the amounts of guanine and cytosine would also be the same, at least like very, very close to being the same. Uh, same thing with, you know, plants, with, with all kinds of mammals, like no matter what he isolated the DNA from, he found that these two always came together in groups. So like Watson and Crick basically had like the pieces of the puzzle, right? They knew that these four nucleotides composed DNA. They knew that for whatever reason, there was the same amount of adenine and thymine and the same amount of cytosine and guanine. What they didn't know is how these four nucleotides actually fit together to make the physical structure of DNA. And they didn't understand like how DNA was a replicating molecule. Because as we talked about during the process of cell division, DNA is replicated or copied you know, before cells divide. And so the, the model of DNA that they were trying to come up with had to be able to explain a couple of things. It had to explain how those four pieces fit together, but also how DNA could be a self-replicating molecule. So they'd been working on this for a substantial time, and, and to be honest, they were stuck uh, up until they found the research of two other scientists. So the people who really helped them were actually two other British scientists. It was Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. Uh, they were doing research at King's College in England, and they're using a technique called X-ray diffraction. So what this is, is a very similar to like the way we use X-rays now to look at like bones and other internal structures, but they're using concentrated X-rays to look at smaller parts of the cell, specifically DNA. And this is a technique that was used like, before electron microscopes really became prominent. Uh, X-ray diffraction was one of the ways you could see much smaller things you know, that you can't see without the use of, or I should say, with the use of like a compound light microscope. So it gives you much better resolution and a greater quality image. And you'll actually see one of the images that they produced uh, coming up in a minute here. But one of the things that they found uh, was actually the image that led to the breakthrough for Watson and Crick to allow them to develop their model of DNA. So if you keep in mind that Wilkins and Franklin, they're looking at DNA under uh, X-ray diffraction, the, the image that they have that leads to the breakthrough of, of Watson and Crick is this one. And it's referred to as Photo 51. So it was part of a, a photo array that they published in a scientific journal. And once Watson and Crick saw this image, they very quickly were able to understand the structure of DNA. And the thing to remember about an X-ray is that an X-ray is a two-dimensional image. So if you look at this, and I remember seeing this image as a high school student and thinking like, what's the big deal about this? It's an X. And it wasn't until later on when I was actually taking genetics that, that I fully understood, you know, why this helped uh, Watson and Crick so much. And, and the thing that would have been helpful at the time when I was in high school would be to see like a model of the structure of DNA next to photo 51. So again, if you look at this one, you just think like, well, it's, it's an X shape. Like, why was this so helpful to Watson and Crick? And what they were able to figure out is that they knew this was a two-dimensional image and they were smart enough to realize, okay, so this isn't actually an X. The reason we've been having so much trouble assembling this molecule of DNA is because it's a spiral. And so what you're seeing in the middle part of this image is like the part of the spiral where the two backbone parts of DNA kind of overlap each other. So you're seeing like this part of the DNA structure in photo 51. So after seeing this, Watson and Crick were able to take some measurements and do some things that allowed them to relatively quickly develop a functioning model of DNA. 
but it really wasn't until they saw this image that uh, that they had a uh, breakthrough. So photo 51 is, is really like the catalyst that got them moving with their model of DNA. So once they have seen um, Franklin's image, and, and she's actually the one who took it, uh, Rosalind Franklin took the image, she's working with Maurice Wilkins, right? But it was her image, that photo 51, that, uh, that helped Watson and Crick. So using that part of her data, that image she produced, and then Erwin Chargoff's pairs, knowing that adenine goes with thymine and cytosine goes with guanine, they were able to build a functioning model of DNA. Uh, so this model had three important sort of like rules to it or, or foundational pieces that uh, were the main contributions of Watson and Crick. The first thing is that that backbone of DNA, the thing that makes the X shape in, uh, in the image, that consists of these alternating deoxyribose sugars and phosphate molecules. So later on, we'll actually take a look at the, the structure of nucleotides. Nucleotides involve a deoxyribose and then a phosphate. The other thing they involve are the different bases we were talking about. So the, the nitrogenous bases are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, the, the three, or I should say the, the, uh, the four that we were talking about before. Uh, something else that Watson and Crick figured out is that cytosine and guanine go together because of the number of hydrogen bonds they form. So cytosine and guanine each form three hydrogen bonds, and, and that's why Chargoff's rule states that, well, they always go together. He knew that was true from studying all these organisms, but he didn't know why. So uh, Watson and Crick were able to figure out why. Well, it's because of the, the number of hydrogen uh, bonds that they make, whereas adenine and thymine, they're only connected by two hydrogen bonds. So those two always go together because, again, they have the same pairing structure. So it's almost like puzzle pieces, right? Like they have complementary shapes. C and G fit together. A and T fit together. You always see them pairing together in the model of DNA. So uh, this picture does a pretty good job of representing those things. So we've got like the sugar phosphate backbone to, uh, to DNA. Um, this one would actually be the deoxyribose sugar. Uh, deoxyribose is what's called a pentose sugar. So it has five carbons on it. Each of the points on that molecule represent a carbon. Uh, you've seen phosphates before represented as sort of just like a, a little circle, looks like a little ball. Uh, you think about the way you saw like ATP molecules represented earlier in the year. So it's the same kind of representation you're seeing there. And then the third part to one of these nucleotides is the base. So there's always going to be a sugar. There's always going to be a phosphate. There will always be a base, but the base is sometimes different. So you can see like this whole thing is outlined and described as a nucleotide. Uh, this one happens to have cytosine as the base, but you know, the next one that's attached has an adenine for a base. Then this one is a guanine. You know, we've got thymine over here. So we've got all of them represented. Uh, but the other reason I like this image is it shows the hydrogen bond pairs. So these dashed lines represent hydrogen bonds. Remember, those are weaker bonds compared to like a covalent or ionic bonds, but they're still um, holding the molecule of DNA together. C and G makes three hydrogen bonds, whereas adenine and thymine only make two. Another thing we'll talk about in a later video when we're talking about Chargoff's rule is the pairing structure that you'll see here. It's always one of the smaller varieties of nitrogenous bases. So thymine is called a purine. It's, I'm sorry, a pyrimidine. It's, a, it's one of the smaller nitrogenous bases, whereas adenine is a pyrimidine. It's, it's one of the larger ones. So we see like a small one with a big one. So you know, adenine has this like extra ring on it, and so does guanine. So I guess my red pointer doesn't show as well on the guanine. But um, those two have an, an extra ring uh, so that they're, they're a, bit, uh, a bit bigger. But We'll, we'll talk about that more in a, in a later video with those. But I guess what, one way to kind of remember that is a, a pyrimidines, even though it's the, the bigger word, it's the smaller molecule, right? So the pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine, whereas the purines are the smaller word, but it's the larger molecule. So like adenine is a purine and then guanine is a purine. Um, another way to, I guess, kind of cheat and remember that is pyrimidine has a Y in it, and uh, so does thymine and cytosine. So it's, it's a way to kind of associate those together, that the, uh, the pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine, that the purines are adenine and guanine. So you always see that pairing of, uh, of one pyrimidine with, uh, with one purine. Uh, but then we got our picture of Watson and Crick over here talking about their, uh, their model of DNA. So the, uh, the physical model that they produced looks generally like the, uh, the one in the image over here. 
Um, so the final thing to talk about is just the recognition that these guys got. Uh, Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the structure of DNA in 1962. Uh, the thing that is interesting about this is that Rosalind Franklin isn't included in the Nobel Prize. And uh, I remember learning about this in high school, and we were never really told why, or right? it wasn't talked about, like, well, why wasn't Rosalind Franklin included? And, and I just kind of assumed, well, you know, it's, it's the 60s, you know, she's a woman, she wasn't included uh, because of, like, sexism, and she was excluded for that reason. And so it's sort of like a misconception that I carried with me for a while until I learned more about genetics later on. And the, the interesting thing about this story is that Rosalind Franklin wasn't excluded because uh, she was a woman. She was actually very important to the uh, discovery of, of the uh, structure of DNA. And, and Watson and Crick gave her very much credit uh, for contributing you know, Photo 51 towards their research that they needed in order to come up with that model. Uh, the reason that Franklin was excluded is because she actually died before Watson and Crick uh, received the, uh, the Nobel Prize. So you can see she dies here in, in 1958. Um, the problem was she's doing this x-ray diffraction research. As much as we knew about x-rays and, and how to use them to get good images of the cell, people didn't understand that you were being exposed to low levels of radiation uh, when you're using those x-rays. So if you think about like all the modern precautions that are taken when, um, when you're t like, given an x-ray at the doctor or something like that with like the lead vest to protect you and all those things, uh, there was nothing like that back at, at this time. And actually a lot of the early molecular biologists like Franklin uh, ended up having uh, significant problems with x-ray exposure. So uh, she's one where she died very early, you know, like in, in her late 30s. Uh, so it has nothing to do with, uh, with sexism or anything like that. It was simply something that uh, we didn't quite understand at, at that time about the research that she was doing. But I hope this kind of gives you a, a primer on some of the scientists. I know we don't always talk about a lot of the scientists like this, uh, but this chapter, I think they're interesting because we start talking about like our first Americans, first really prevalent female scientist. And I think just the story behind this one is a little bit more engaging than, uh, than the story with some of the other scientists earlier in the year. So thank you for watching and I will see you in class.